An Old-Fashioned Christmas Eve The wind whistled through the old maple and linden trees outside my windows. The snow swirled down the street and the sky was as dark as any December sky can be here in Christiania. My mood was equally dark. It was Christmas Eve, the first I would not be spending by that old familiar hearth. A little while previously I had been commissioned an officer, and I thought to gladden my old parents with my presence, and had hoped to show myself in all my splendour and regalia to the girls of my home village, but a typhoid fever had sent me to the hospital. A week hence I had been discharged, and I now found myself in celebrated condition of convalescence. I had written home for the large dapple grey horse and my father's reindeer fur coat, but the letter would scarcely reach the dale before Boxing Day, and only around New Year's Eve could I expect the horse to get here. My friends had left the city, and I had no family to whom I could comfort myself with. The two elderly spinsters with whom I lodged were certainly genteel and kind people, and they had looked after me and with great concern in the early stages of my illness, but their whole way of being was much too old-fashioned to appeal to youthful tastes. Their thoughts preferred to dwell in the past, and when, as often happened, they told me stories related to the city, they reminded me both in their subject and naivete of times long gone by. With this naive lady's old-fashioned demeanour, the house they occupied was quite the match. It was one of the old tenement buildings on Custom House Lane, with deep windows, long eerie passageways and staircases, dark rooms and lofts, that involuntarily brought upon thoughts of Nissa and Spooks. Exactly the same kind of tenement, perhaps it is the very same, as Maurits Hansen portrayed in his tale, The Old Woman with the Bonnet. The circle of my landlady's acquaintance was also rather limited. Besides a married sister, no one but a couple of dull madams came to visit. The only life-bringing guests were a beautiful niece and some cheerful, lively nephews and nieces for whom I always had to tell Nissa stories and fairy tales. I tried to pull myself out of the melancholia of loneliness and disheartment by watching the many people who passed up and down the street against the swirling snow and biting wind with red-blue noses and squinting eyes. It began to amuse me, observing the hustle and bustle that occupied the pharmacy across the street. The door stood still but a moment. Servants and farmers streamed in and out, pausing to study their prescriptions when they came out onto the street again. It appears that some managed to decipher them, but others stood long and studied and shook their heads pensively, the task seeming too difficult for them. Dusk came, and I could no longer see their faces, but stared instead at the old building, as the pharmacy was back then, it stood with its dark red-brown walls, pointed gables, and tower with the weather wane and stained glass windows as a reminder of the architectural art during Christian IV's reign. Only the swan was then, as it is now, very sedate, with a gold ring around its neck, riding boots on its feet, and wings poised for flight. I was just about to go deeper in my reflections on captive birds, when I was interrupted by noise and children's laughter coming from the room beside mine, then followed by a faint, maidenly knocking at the door. Upon my come in, the eldest of my hostesses, Miss Meta, stepped in with an old-fashioned courtesy, asked how I was feeling, and requested, in a long-winded, roundabout way, that I should join them for the evening. It's not good for you to sit here alone in the darkness, dear lieutenant, she continued. Won't you come in to us instead? Old Mother Scow and my brother's small girls have come, Perhaps they will cheer you up a little, you're after all so fond of the children. I accepted the friendly invitation. A fire was burning in a large tile stove, casting red flickering light into the room through the wide open stove door when I walked in. The room was very deep, and furnished in an old-fashioned manner, with Russian leather chairs and one of those canapes designed for panniered skirts and very proper postures. The walls were adorned with oil paintings, portraits of stiff ladies with powdered coiffure, of Oldenburgers, and other reputable persons in plates of armour and red dresses. You must truly excuse us, Lieutenant, that we haven't yet lighted the candles, said Miss Cecilia, the youngest sister who came to meet me with a courtesy identical to that of her sister. But the children like to play in the light of the fire in the twilight, and Mother Scow enjoys a bit of conversation by the hearth. Conversation here and conversation there. You enjoy a good gossiping yourself while you're sewing, Missy, and you put the blame on us answered the old, tight-chested lady addressed as Mother Scow. Well, look at that. Good evening, sir. Come and sit down here and tell me how you are. You're the very picture of frailty, she said to me, and chuckled over her own mire of amenity. I narrated of my sickness, and received in return a very long and an overly careful account of her rheumatism and asthmatic troubles. 
As luck would have it, we were interrupted by the children rushing in from the kitchen where they had paid a visit to the old housemaid, Stina. Auntie, do you know what Stina says? cried the small, lively, brown-eyed creature. She says that I should go with her to the hayloft this evening and give the Nissa Christmas porridge. But I don't want to go, I'm afraid of the Nissa. Oh, Stina is just saying that to get rid of you. She dare not go to the hayloft after dark herself, the silly thing. For she remembers how she was scared by the Nissa once, said Miss Meta. But will you not come and greet the lieutenant now, children? Oh dear, is that you, lieutenant? I didn't recognize you. You're so pale. It's so long since I saw you last. All two children spoke at once and flocked around me. Now you have to tell us something funny. It's been so long since you told us a story. Oh, tell us the story about Buttercup, please. Tell us the story about Buttercup and Goldtooth. I had to tell them the story about Buttercup and his dog Goldtooth, and then followed by a couple of stories about the rivaling Nissa from Vaken and Bure, who stole hay from each other, and then met each other with a load of hay on their backs and then fought so fiercely they both disappeared in a storm of hay. I had to tell them about the Nisse of Hesselberg who teased the farm dog until the man threw him over the barn. The children clapped their hands and laughed. It served him right, the ugly Nisse, they said and wanted more. No, now you're bothering the lieutenant children, said Miss Cecilia. I'm sure Aunt Mette will tell you a tale. Yes, tell us a tale, Aunt Mette, they all cried together. I'm not sure what story to tell, Aunt Mette answered. But since we have started talking about Nisse, I too will tell you something about him. Do you remember old Kari Geistal children? who was here and baked flatbread and lefsir, and also had so many stories to tell. Oh yes, cried the children. Well, old Kadi told me that he served at the orphanage here in the city many years ago. At the time, it was even lonelier and more miserable in that sort of time than it even is today, and it's a dark and creepy building, that orphanage. Well, when Kadi arrived there, she was to be the cook, and she was a very good and hard-working girl. One night, she was going to get up early and start the brewing, but the other servant girls said to her, you must take care not to get up too early. You mustn't put the mash on before two o'clock. Why is that? she asked. You know well that there's Anissa here, and you should know that he doesn't like to be bothered so early, and you absolutely must never put on the mash before two o'clock, they said. Ah, uh, nothing worse, said Cardi. She was as bold as brass, as they say. I have no trouble with Nissa, and if he comes to me, well then, I'll be damned if I don't shoo him out the door. The others said she should take care, but she did not change her mind, and when the time was no more than a little past one, she got up and stoked the fire under the vat and put the mash on. But the fire kept going out under the vat. It was as if someone was chasing the fire up the chimney. But who it was she couldn't see. She gathered kindling and stoked the fire time after time. But it never got any better, and the mash wouldn't boil either. At last she had her fill, took a log from the fire and ran with it, both high and low, swung it around and shouted, Get yourself back to where you came from, and if you think you can scare me, then you're wrong. Pa, let it be so then. The answer came from one of the darkest corners. I have gotten seven souls here in this house. I thought I would get the eighth too. Since that time, no one has seen or heard from the Nissa in the orphanage, said Cardi Geistal. Oh, I'm scared. No, you tell, Lieutenant. When you tell, I never get frightened, for you always tell the stories so funny, said one of the smallest ones. Another suggested that I should tell them of the Nissa who danced howling with a girl. It was a tale I would rather not begin, for there was a song to go with it, but they would in no way let me off the hook, and I had just began to cough my terribly disharmonic voice ready to sing the howling tune that went with the tale when the beautiful niece stepped in, to the joy of the children and to my salvation. Yes, children, now I will tell you the story if you can get Cousin Lisa to sing the howling for you. I said that she took her place, and you will all dance yourself, won't you? The cousin was set upon by the small ones, and he promised to perform the dance music as I narrated. Once upon a place, I think it might have been in Hallingdal, there was a girl who was supposed to take some cream porridge to the Nissa. If it was a Thursday evening or Christmas Eve, I do not remember, but I think it must have been Christmas Eve. Well, she thought it would be a shame to waste such good food on the Nissa, so she ate it up herself and drank the fat too, and went out to the barn with porridged oats and soured milk and a pig trough. There's your trough, ugly! she said, but the words had hardly left her lips before the Nissa came out, grabbed her and began to dance with her. He carried on until she lay gasping and when people came to the barn in the morning, she was more dead than alive. But as long as he was dancing, the Nissa sang, and here Miss Lisa took over the role of the Nissa and sang a howling refrain. Oh, you have eaten the porridge for the Tumpte, you. Oh, then you shall dance with the Tumpte, you. Oh, you have eaten the porridge for the Tumpte, you. Oh, then you shall dance with the Tumpte, you. I helped tap out the rhythm with both feet, while children made an absolute racket and joyfully tumbled around each other on the floor. 
I believe you're turning the room upside down, children. You're making such a mighty commotion that my head aches, said old Mother Scow. Calm yourself a bit, and I'll tell you a few stories. It grew quiet in the room, and the matriarch began to tell. People, they tell so many tales about Nissa and Huldurs and such, but I'm not a great believer in all of that. I have never seen the one nor the other of them. Of course, I haven't traveled far in my life either, and I think it's nothing but talk. But old Stina out there, she's seen the Nissa, so she says. When I worked for the parson, she was a serving girl at my parents' house, and an old skipper came to them, who had retired from the sea. It was so quiet and calm there, they never went to visit anyone, and no one came to visit them, and the skipper was never any further than down the pier. I remember how he used to walk down there in his slippers and his white nightcap, long pipe with a long grey pearl grey coat with steel buttons. They always went to bed early, and there was a nissa there, they said. But there was this one time, said Zina, when the cook and I, we sat up one evening in the girls' quarters to look after things and sew for ourselves, and it grew close to bedtime, for the watchman had already called out ten o'clock. Sewing and stopping would have to stop, for sleep would soon overcome us, and just like that, I began to nod off, then the cook would nod off, for we had been up since early morning doing the washing. But as we sat there nodding one after another, we heard a terrible noise from the kitchen, she said. It was as if someone had knocked all the plates together and thrown them on the floor. We shut up, she said, and I screamed, God help us, it's Anissa! And I was so scared that I didn't dare set foot in the kitchen. The cook was pretty terrified too, I'm sure, but she bolstered herself, walked into the kitchen, and all the plates lay on the floor, but none was broken, and Anissa stood in the door with his red woolen hat on and laughed heartily. But she had heard that once in a while Anissa had been fooled into leaving when someone asked and said that it was more peaceful for him somewhere else and she had long been wondering how she might fool him. And then she said to him, her voice a little shaky, that he should move to the coppersmith across the street. It was quieter there, for they went to bed at 9 o'clock every evening. That was true too, she told me. But you see, the master was up working with everyone, apprentices, journeymen and all, from 3 in the morning and all day long. Since then, she said, we saw the Nissen no more at the skipper's, but he liked it well at the smith, even though they hammered and worked all day, for people said that the wife there put out some porridge in the loft for him every Thursday evening. And it's hardly surprising they grew rich, for the Nissen surely did leave and go to them, but whether it was because the Nissen helped them, that I wouldn't be able to say, Mother Scab added. She coughed and cleared her voice. It was an unusually long tale for her. When she had taken a pinch of snuff, she recovered and began another tale. My mother, she was an honest woman. She told a tale of something that happened here in the city, and it happened one Christmas Eve, and I know it to be true, for there never came an untrue word out of her mouth. Let us hear it, Mother Scow, I said. Tell, do tell, Mother Scow, the children cried. The lady coughed a little and took another pinch. When my mother was yet a girl, she used to visit a widow she knew. Like her, yes, what was her name again? Madame... No, I can't remember, but it doesn't matter. She led up in Miller Street and was a woman in her prime. So it was Christmas Eve, just like today, and she thought to herself that she would go to Matins on Christmas morning, for she frequented often at a church. And she put out some coffee so that she would have something warm to drink and that she wouldn't be fasting. When she awoke, the moon was shining onto the floor, but when she got up and looked at the clock, it had stopped and the hands pointed at half past eleven. She didn't know what time of night it was, so she went to the window and looked out towards the church. There was light in all of the church windows, so she woke her maid and had her boil the coffee while she dressed, took her psalter and went off to the church. The street was very quiet, and she didn't see a single person in the street. When she came to the church, she sat down at her usual seat in the pews, but when she looked around her, she thought that everyone looked so pale and strange, just as if they were dead, every one of them. There was no one there she knew, but there were many she thought she had seen before, but she couldn't remember where she had seen them. When the parson entered the pulpit, she saw that he was not one of the city's parsons. He was a tall, pale man, and she thought she ought to recognize him too. He preached a beautiful sermon. There wasn't the noise of coughing and harking there usually is at Muttins on Christmas morning. It was so quiet that she was terrified. When they began to sing again, a lady who was sitting beside her leaned towards her and whispered in her ear, Throw your coat around you loosely and leave, for if you stay until it's finished here, they'll make an end of you. It is the dead that are holding service. Oh, I'm scared. I'm scared, Mother Scow, whined one of the little ones and crept up under a chair. Hush, hush, children. She comes from it well, you'll hear it now, said Mother Scow. But the madam was also scared. For when she heard the voice and looked at the woman, she recognized her. 
It was her neighbor who had passed many years before, and when she looked around the church again, she remembered how she had seen both the parson and many of the congregation before. They were all long dead. Cold shivers ran down her, so fearful was she. She threw her coat loosely around her, as the lady had said, and walked out. But as she went, she felt them all turn and reach after her, and her legs began to tremble under her, so that she nearly sank to the church floor. When she came out on the church steps, she felt them grab hold of her coat. She let go of it, let them have it, and hurried home as quickly as she could. When she came in the door, the clock struck one, and when she was in, she was nearly half dead. So frightened was she. In the morning, when people came to the church, the coat lay on the steps, but it had been ripped into a thousand pieces. My mother, she had seen the like many times before. It was a short coat of light red fabric with hair skin lining and edging, like those that were still worn when I was a child. It's strange to see them now, but there are some old ladies here in the city and at the foundation in the old town, whom I see at church will still wear coats like that around Christmas. The children who had shown their fear during the first part of the tale declared that they didn't wish to hear any more such terrible tales. They had crept up onto the canopy and the chairs and said they felt there was something sitting under the table grasping after them. Just then the candles were brought in, into old candelabra, and we discovered with laughter that they sat with their legs on the table. The candles and the Christmas pudding, preserves, pastries and mead soon chased away the ghost stories and the fear, refreshed the minds and turned the conversation towards the living and current events. Last, the rice porridge and the roast pork ribs were brought out which led our thoughts to the concrete and we parted early, wishing each other a Merry Christmas. But I had a restless night. I don't know if it was the tales, the food, my weakness, or all of it together that caused it. I lay and tossed and turned and was among the stories about the Nissa, Huldurs and ghosts all night. At last I went to church, with the bells sounding through the ear. The church was well lit, and when I went in it was the church back home in the dale. There was no one to see except the lads from the dale in their red woolen hats, fully uniformed soldiers and farm girls in headscarves and red cheeks. The parson stood up on the pulpit. It was my grandfather who had died when I was little, but when he was in the middle of his sermon, he did a cartwheel down into the midst of the church. He was known as a quick fella, so that his cassock flew in one direction and his collar in the other. There lies the parson, and here I am, he said, a turn of phrase he often had, and let's have a dance. Immediately, the whole congregation erupted into the wildest of dances, and a big tall boy from the dale came and took me by the shoulder and said, You should come with me, my friend. I didn't know what to think, but I awoke, and I felt the same grip on my shoulder and saw the same boy I saw in my dream, leaning over my bed, with his red wool hat pulled down over his ears, a reindeer fur coat over his arm, and a pair of large eyes that bored into me. You're dreaming, my friend, he said. Your brow is heavy with sweat, and you're sleeping heavier than a beer in hibernation. God's peace and Merry Christmas from your old man and everyone in the dale. Here's a letter from the magistrate and a reindeer fur coat for you. The large dapple is in the courtyard. But in God's name, is that you, Thor? It was my father's farmhand, a marvellous boy from the dale. How on earth have you managed to come so quickly? I cried with joy. Well, I'll tell you, Thor answered. I came with a dapple, but otherwise... I was with the magistrate out in Nes, and he said to me, Thor, he said, it's not far to the city. You take the dapple and go check in on the lieutenant, and if he's well enough and can travel, then bring him with you, he said. Well, we rode from town, it was clear again, and the conditions were perfect. The dapple strode out with his quick old legs, and such a Christmas like I experienced that time, I have never experienced, neither before nor since. <laughs>